The following program is paid by Praise Assembly Church Ministries. Welcome to Praise Assembly Church Ministries, a community church focused on family, individual growth, and most importantly, the Word of God. We are here to share the love of Jesus Christ, encourage kingdom living, and equip you with the tools you will need to live the abundant life God has promised. Today you will hear an uplifting word from God shared by our pastor, Dr. Johnny L. York. It is our prayer that you will receive a personal message from the Lord today. Thank you for tuning in. Now let's join our service. God is stretching me. Delphine Jenin, you may not have heard of her, is a world-renowned lecturer, entrepreneur. She is a professor, publicist. She publishes articles in higher institutions such as MIT and Harvard University. She is considered by far and wide an expert on learning. She is a learning consultant specialist. Due to her deep expertise and knowledge in metacognition and neuroscience. And she takes the two and she applies it in her classroom to teach her students. Metacognition is the ability to hone in on one's own thought process. How they think, how they observe, how they learn. Neuroscience is a scientific study of one's behavior pattern, particularly as it relates to their nervous system and brain. And she takes it to and she applies it in her classroom to keep her students engaged. And like other, other teachers, Delphine Jenin has to compete with TV, streaming, students gaming, trading cryptocurrency. She has to c compete with those things to keep her students' attention. But unlike most teachers, Delphine overcomes that by courage and what she says is a little bit of wickedness. Yeah. Courage in a sense that unlike some teachers, she does things that teachers are afraid to do. A little bit of wickedness in that Delphine intentionally gets to know her students. She builds a relationship with them so that she can understand how each individual thinks. She wants to understand the idiosyncrasies, what makes you you, what makes you act in the way that you act under pressure. And she does that only to later intentionally and constructively overwhelm her students. Most teachers will say that is wicked because when you overwhelm your students, you have a tendency to burn them out. You have a tendency to make them feel inadequate a tendency to make them feel insecure. And while it seems like it is a form of wickedness, I see it as a form of godliness. Because if you can recall in Numbers 11, when God chose Moses to lead the Israelites through the wilderness, he had to overwhelm Moses to bring him to a point of being a certain type of leader. Because Moses, his father-in-law, had told him in Exodus, what you are doing, you are going to burn yourself out. Moses was trying to play judge and jury and lecturer for thousands of Israelites. And he said, you cannot do this all by yourself. And so in stages, God had to continue to teach Moses. But in Numbers 11, he kind of got to a breaking point. Because the Israelites, as they were going through the wilderness, they began to complain. 
And they said, God, uh, we are tired of what is on your menu. We don't like this fresh manna. Yes, you delivered us out of Egypt, but we kind of want to go back to eating what we were eating when we were in bondage. We want the fish. We want the cucumbers and the melons and the leek and the garlic and the onions. And God was so upset that he caused a fire to happen around their camp to the point that they then began to cry out to Moses and say and said, Moses, intercede on our behalf. And Moses interceded to God and said, God, please stop the fire. And the fire stopped. And they kept complaining. And it got to the point that now Moses was complaining about who God put in his life. And he said, God, I don't want to do this anymore. And in fact, he said, did I conceive all these people? Did I beget them that you should say to me, carry them in your bosom as a garden carries a nursing child to the land which you swore to their families? Where am I to get meat to give all these people? For they weep all over me, saying, give us meat that we may eat. And he got to the point that he was overwhelmed. Overwhelmed in the wilderness, overwhelmed by the people, overwhelmed with them complaining. And he says, I am not able to bear all of these people alone. Because the burden is too heavy for me. Like Delphine and like God did with Moses, he has a way of putting us in a position where you were overwhelmed with people, you were overwhelmed with sickness, you were overwhelmed with your finances and the issues and the multitude around your life, where you will get to a point where you say, God, I cannot do this all by myself. The burden is too heavy for and when he gets you to that point, that confession is a key that will unlock a door to deeper learning, to deeper engagement, to deeper dependency on the source of your power. And when you begin to depend on the source of that power, then that power can then reach down on the inside and begin to pull out what it put on the inside of you. Because there is a greater person that is living on the inside of you. And though you are overwhelmed at your job, you're overwhelmed at home, you've been overwhelmed as a parent, overwhelmed as a spouse. God said greater is on the way. Greater shall be in your future. But you first got to let me stretch and pull on you and twist you and press on you and turn you and put you in a position that no one else can put you in. Because I am getting ready to pull someone out of you that I put down on the inside before you were formed in the womb. I knew you, I sanctified you, I called you to be a prophet, and there shall be everything that I spoke over your life shall come to pass. For eyes have not seen, ears have not heard, nor has it entered the hearts of men what God is going to do in your life and you just have to be in a position where you receive the word of God over your life and stop fighting and stop trying to do everything on your own and by yourself and just give it to God. Because like it said, when you put everything in God's hand, then you'll start seeing God in everything, every place of your life, every move that you make. When you say, I can't do this all by myself, the burden is too heavy. God is saying, thank you, because now I am getting ready to do a new thing in your life.
I'm getting ready to stretch you. I'm getting ready to move you beyond where you've been. Stretching, it makes you flexible. Yes, it makes you nimble, but you know what stretching really is? Stretching retrains your nervous system to be able to allow for a greater extension. And so God is moving into the area of your metacognition and your neuroscience. And he says, I know who you are. I know how you think. And I am getting ready to stretch you because the way that you behave is getting ready to align with what I have called to come to pass in your life. You're in a good place now, but God says greater. You're feeling fine now, but God is saying greater. I know you're okay financially, but God is saying greater. Greater is coming. And God is stretching you beyond who you are beyond where you've been because somebody needs whoever is locked down on the inside of you. Somebody needs to hear the word that God has put in your life. God needs you to just give it to him. You can't be everybody every time all in one place. That is ungodly. He created us as humans. He is the one who never slumbers. He is the one who never sleeps. Sometimes you just got to give it to God. Because God is standing and he's ready to work in your life. And it's in the text. Because the disciples, after being charged and sent out two by two, they began to preach and teach the gospel. They were healing the sick. Teaching about the kingdom. And they gathered all in one place, much like you and I will have to gather one day in heaven to give an accord of what we did on this earth to further the kingdom. They gathered to a place to give their report of what they did, the works that were wrought by them, the lives that were saved sickness and disease that they healed. And it got to the point that God said, come aside, Jesus said, come aside by yourselves to a deserted place and rest a while. Because I don't know if you know, the disciples were working, they were hungry, they were tired. And if you don't know, I know some people make it look easy, but ministry can be hard. Ministry can be rewarding, but it can be taxing. You can be fulfilled in ministry, but you can also get to a point where you are drained and you feel empty. And Jesus is saying, Sometimes the most spiritual thing that you can do is rest. It's find a place where you can steal away and spend some time with Jesus. Come to a deserted place, an uninhabited place, a quiet place, place for rest, place for renewal, place for reflection place for revelation. 
come to a deserted place. And some of us, you may not necessarily be in ministry, but you know what the disciples are going through. You are surrounded by so many people who just pull on you, who just drain you. You don't have friends, but you got a lot of followers on Instagram. You got a lot of followers on TikTok. And you wonder why you can't find peace. And so God has to call you to a deserted place. And the professor of all professors is tapping into their nervous system, the neuroscience. Because when you go to a deserted place, in their mind, they're getting ready to go on vacation. And I don't know about you, but vacation for me doesn't start when I get to the place that I'm going. As soon as I walk in the airport, my body just, ah, thank you, Jesus. I don't have to see the plane, but I know where I'm going. And the disciples step on the boat with Jesus. They're getting ready to go to a deserted place for rest and comfort. I don't know what the conversation was like, but I wonder if they said, God, thank you for the rest. Thank you, Jesus, for the birds that are just chirping around this sea. Thank you, God, for the boat and the, the smell of the salt water. My body is just relaxed already. God, I know what you did at Canna. Uh, uh, can, can you take some of this salt water and just give me a glass of wine? You know, I could, I could, I could use that. <laughs> and as they kicked back, started relaxing, and they looked up, the Bible says, but the multitude. You ever been to a point in your life where you were getting ready to go somewhere, you're on vacation at a point of relaxation, or you're, you're feeling like this is my time with God? And the multitude of your issues beat you to where you were going? It is the equivalent of us getting ready to take a group trip to Jamaica. And we get on the plane, and you are relaxed. And as soon as you get to customs, there's stress holding up the sign. Hey, where are we staying tonight? <laughs> there are the situations that overwhelm you that are waiting for you as soon as you get there. And the disciples are at a point where they are tired, they are frustrated. I believe they are questioning Jesus like, what is going on? You saw the multitude on the mountain beating us to our destination. Why didn't you change the, the direction of the boat? We could have gone somewhere else. Jesus, why did you have to get off of the boat? And Jesus is teaching them. He's stretching them by way of, of example, and he's showing them you have to have compassion for people despite what you are feeling. Because earlier in Mark, we learned that Jesus is going through himself. His cousin, John the Baptist, was just beheaded. He is grieving. And I think part of the reason why he said, come aside and let's go to a deserted place, and he's joining them because he needs to grieve too. But the people, not because they're sick, not because they're diseased, not because some of them may be enslaved by the Romans, but because they were like a sheep without a shepherd that moved his heart to act beyond what he was feeling. But the disciples didn't catch it. He called them to be apostles, and they had been preaching, they had been teaching, they had been healing the sick. But then they get to this point, and they don't want to do anything. 
And so it is now an environment where the church is sitting on his hands doing nothing. And Jesus has to do some things to grow them and to stretch them beyond where they are. So he has compassion for the people. And he begins teaching them many things. And in today's world, you have a lot of people who, are, who cry compassion. But in reality, they show pity. I was moved not in a good way by a video that was shared online. And it was talking about a rapper, uh, Takeoff, who was shot and killed, part of uh, the rap group Migos. And, and I, I just had a problem with people who were saying it was just a sad story. And you see people on the video just shaking their heads and you know people who invited uh, him to, to the party, just walking by the dead body, shaking his head. And I'm, I'm saying to myself, that is pity. That is not compassion. Compassion moves you to act to correct the wrongs that you see. We just had a huge election, and I don't want to get political, but you know, part of the issue with that people are so frustrated with the politicians is because you have people in power see people being shot down, people who are homeless, and they get there in Washington and they scream compassion, but it's like, you're not doing anything. It's pity. And we have a lot of people who are pitiful. They are full of pity. And Jesus is saying compassion, but we should expect that of the world. But God forbid that the church gets to the point where it becomes desensitized to the needs of people and loses its compassion. And if you want to know when you need a moment in life, if you want to know when God is getting ready to pull you to the side, it's when you have lost your compassion. When you no longer see the needs of people through the eyes of grace and mercy. But you see them as an annoyance. And the disciples are at the point where they need to be pushed aside for rest and instruction. If you want to know why they need to be moved to the side is because they lost their compassion. If you want to know why they lost their compassion, is because they're annoyed. If you want to know why they are annoyed, you just have to look at the text because the text says that Jesus was teaching them many things. And they walk up to Jesus and they're looking at their watch. And it's, it's saying, I know you're in the middle of teaching. I know you're in the middle of healing and saving lives, but the hour is late. And this is a deserted place. Send them away. Let them fend for themselves. Let them go to their own country and village and buy food. You ever get to the, a place in life where you're just saying, God, send away the multitudes. Send away the multitude of issues in my life. And God is not answering your prayer. And we should be thankful for that because Paul, when he had the revelation after going to the third heaven, he had an abundance of revelation, and he said, there's a thorn in my flesh. And three times I prayed for God to remove that thorn. And he said, my grace is sufficient. My strength is made perfect in your weakness. When you're overwhelmed by your thorn, when you're overwhelmed by your multitude, it is not for me to move it away. It is for you to see me as being greater than your thorn. It is for you to see me as being greater than the multitude. I'm greater than the issues in your life. 
It is a call to dependency. And he is calling the disciples to depend on him. Because if you are not careful, the devil will have you focus more so on your, res on your resources and have you focus on the multitude while Jehovah Jireh is standing right in front of you. When El Shaddai, who is more than sufficient, who's more than enough, is standing in front of you. Where Elohim, your Adonai, he's standing right there in front of you. And he's saying that I am greater. And you should know that if you have me in your life, you don't need anyone else. You don't need anything else. You don't have to have the finances when you have Jesus. You may have a little bit of food, but you have Jesus. And I don't need anything big because God says I specialize in small. Just I know you have a mountain before you, but if you just have faith the size of a, just a small mustard seed. Elisha's maidservant had but a small jar, and God turned it to an overflow. Samson had but just a small jawbone of a donkey, and he slayed a thousand giants. David had just a small stick and five small stones, and he was able to slay Goliath. If you realize with your small, God can do plenty. That is the point. He's bringing them to dependency. And to show them in real time, he says, how many loaves do you have? Go and see. Because they got to the point where they're saying, God, uh, the salary that, that we have, 200 denarii, is it really enough? I mean, can we feed all of them? Thank you for watching Praise Assembly Church Ministries with Dr. Johnny L. York. If you were blessed by today's message and would like a CD or DVD, email us at info at pacmchurch.org. Praise Assembly is a ministry where everyone is welcomed. Come join us for our Sunday worship services at 3254 Kernsville Road, Winston-Salem, North Carolina. For more information, visit our website at pacmchurch.org. See you next week at the same place and time. And remember, it's all about Jesus. Praise Assembly Church Ministries is a place where everyone's welcome, a place where everyone fits in and prayer is the foundation of everything we do. A life-changing church where you can become who God created you to be, where Jesus is the minister of the sanctuary and people will love you just the way you are. At Praise Assembly, the doors are open and we are ready to receive you. Join us Sundays at 6 a.m. right here on the Triad CW. The preceding program is paid for by Praise Assembly Church Ministries.